and we all we're always free to attend. Uh, it's always free to attend anything that we do here, until we come to the fair, but also screenings, performances, and talks like this one. So we have a comprehensive program of free talks. Uh, it's our third one of the day, but we have tomorrow and the day after as well. We've got some amazing speakers, so if you want to come and see those, you're very welcome to. But also, if you wanted to delve into our archive of talks, they're all online on our website, sluice.info. Um, talks about um, art criticism, talks about um, art fairs and what they are and what kind of thing. So there's lots of things to look at, um, but that's uh, just what I wanted to say. Um, I'm going to hand over to this panel, this panel. But first of all, just a little mention of what we're going to be hearing about, although this might be different. Uh, the theme is the University Gallery. What is the role, function, and value of a University Art Gallery? An analysis and discussion of the topic with reference to research from Northumbria University. I was going to introduce everyone by name. But I think, it. no, well, I, shall I do that? I'd love you to do shall that. Shall I just do that? Okay. Um, okay, well, the, the, the talk here, as um, I swear I don't actually know your name, you're. <laughs> <laughs> You're Ben. Hello, Ben. Um, so as Ben has just kind of introduced, um, the talk here is kind of hosted by um, um, Northumbria University, and in particular, um, a group of us who, who work at Northumbria University under the name of Neuschloss. Um, and I should probably just introduce, perhaps, um, those of us on the panel who are part of Neuschloss, which is Thomas Sullivan, uh, Mark Jackson, Chai Danby um, and myself, Joanne Tatham, and we're very pleased to be joined by um, three invited guests who are going to talk to us today. Uh, we have Gavin Wade, who is the director of Eastside Projects. Um, I've actually got, he's actually sent me a written biography as well, so you've actually just said you're an enthusiastic tweeter. <laughs> it's, it's one of the main things That's all you to need say to know. about you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I've kind of worked with, with, with Gavin um, as an artist quite a lot over the last 10, ten, ten years, years as well. Um, so I'm just sort of particularly interested in, in kind of how Eastside projects kind of exist as, you know, as a kind of an art practice, as a kind of curatorial practice, and in particular the fact that um, Eastside projects also has <coughs> a relationship with Birmingham City University. Um, and so Gavin's going to be talking about that for us. Um, have Andrea Phillips, who's just got here. Thank you very much <laughs> for kind of rushing. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm totally sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of invited um, kind of Andrea because of the the, um, the work of hers I've read um, in connection with the How to Work Together um, kind of project, which was um, a collaborative venture between Studio Voltaire, the showroom, and Chisholm Hill. I'm just trying to remember. Um, and I'm just kind of particularly interested, and I'll just read out what you've got here. Um, Andrea lectures and writes about the economic and social construction of publics within contemporary art, the manipulation of forms and participation, and the potential of forms of political, architectural, and social reorganization with an artistic and curatorial culture. So I, I, I read so that out, I'm sorry. So much <laughs> like just, I just tweet. That's it. <laughs> I, 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 I sort of feel yeah. sort of, I felt sort of, too nervous to try and sort of summarise it off the top of my head. I thought it might just, I thought it might just go badly, badly wrong. So I just kind of like, I just, I just fell back on actually Thank reading you, it out. Um, and then I have um, Matthew Matthew Cornford, who's um, professor of fine art at the University of Brighton, um, and also an, an artist as well, um, whose work I've, I've I've known for a very very long time for uh, probably about kind of twenty years. And, and um, we were actually we actually first met. Um, in the context of a university gallery exhibition in 1996. Um, yeah, myself and Tom um, and Matthew with his collaborative partner um, David Cross um, were showing work at Staffordshire University um, in the studios over the summer um, as, as kind of part of, part of a programme which is kind of created by one of the lecturers or a couple of the lecturers who, who are actually kind of working there um, and it was also an exhibition that went out into the city and, and, and was kind of um, had, you had public sighted works as, as part of that. Um, so it's a really, I mean, I haven't actually sort of seen you or met you sort of since that point nearly 20, 20 years ago. Um, it's not such a small world. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but it was just really fascinating. I was actually speaking to Gavin about this, about this conversation um, and sort of suggested that you'd be someone interesting to talk to and tell me about the kind of project you've been, been working on, actually documenting and looking at at sites um, of former local 
art schools in sort of smaller towns, um, some of which no longer kind of exist. And, and it just sort of felt that, that through practice there was a real nice kind of correlation in terms of the, the kind of interest that, that we had um, around the idea of the university gallery. Um, so we're looking forward to, to hear what you've got to say as well there, Matthew. Um, okay, so we're going to briefly introduce um, a little bit more background um, to, to Neuschloss and to the things that Neuschloss are, are interested in um, and what we hope to get out of this talk. So, Charlie, Great. I said everything there. Do I need to do emergency I'm exits? sure there's more than you can say, <laughs> I'm sure there's more. Um, but yeah, so to open up and, and give a little context um, around Neuschloss, I guess this space that we're looking to open up today, we would, we would kind of describe as, as Das Chat. Uh, which is a discursive uh, conversational space um, and it kind of follows a model or a, a set of conversations so this is, this is uh, a, a, a point of progression for us uh, through this, this idea of Das Chat, so it's Das Chat at Slees. Um, so as has been said, Neuschloss is a group of uh, colleagues who are all from Northumbria University uh, which sits in the centre of Newcastle. Uh, we work as lecturers <coughs> Uh, within the university uh, and as artists, curators, writers outside of it. Uh, Neuschloss is a collaborative collective, uh, sorry, collaborative curatorial practice. Um, I think that sits quite close to maybe ways that Gavin has described some of your activities um, of sorts. Um, <laughs> we initiate, make, curate, and uh, devise exhibitions, talks, publications. as a way of thinking about spaces of exhibitions uh, within the university. Um, and relationships of contemporary art practice to teaching and research within higher education. So this collaborative or collective set, set of activities uh, is a means for us to think about ways uh, in which we could do these things differently uh, or perhaps better. Um, Neuschloss are here at Sluice uh, with Gallery North. Uh, Gallery North is one of the galleries uh, in, sorry, at uh, and associated with Northumbria University. Uh, Gallery North was established in 2009. Uh, Neuschloss emerged in 2013, uh, in, largely in response um, to a moment that happened there where the founding director of Gallery North um, uh, retired, um, and that left uh, no clear plans for the gallery. Um, so it was this kind of vacuum uh, which was part of the impetus uh, for Neuschloss. It presented a problem, uh, but of course also an opportunity. Um, at the time, um, most of us were relatively new appointments, um, and our existing interests and involvements outside of the university, uh, and the changes that we're making in terms of the teaching program, um, kind of allowed us to, I guess, respond to that, to that vacant space uh, that arose through, through Gallery North. Um, so I suppose our, our identity and our, our kind of agenda has evolved um, and, and continues to do so very much in relation to the, the mechanisms of the, of the institution that we're involved in. Um, I mean, initially we, we became involved um, in, in Gallery North by um, becoming board members. The gallery actually had a board. Um, but it was, it was through this, through this process of being on the board, um, that we started to recognise um, that there were institutional behaviours that were um, sort of dis distinct to the university and that were markedly different to, to those that we were used to encountering um, within the context of, it, of exhibition that we encountered um, in, in our sort of professional lives, kind of outside of the university. Um, I mean, for example, just the board itself um, seem to function more as a performance um, of, a, of a sort of professional organisational structure rather than sort of fulfilling any kind of legal or kind of fiscal responsibility as it would in, in other professional organisational contexts. And that sort of struck me as really kind of a very sort of curious and kind of frustrating thing that was this mechanism there that was, in a sense, appeared to kind of like guide the direction, appeared to have a responsibility and, and yet actually didn't sort of seem to have any Im impact, you know, meetings occurred, minutes were taken, but nothing of consequence was actually able to be kind of enacted from that meeting. Um, am, I doing, am I reading the next bit as well, Charlie? Mm -hmm. so we haven't had time to prepare. <laughs> um, so, I mean, one of the things that sort of came out of that as well was just realising that the Gallery North um, was viewed very much as a resource by the university executive. It's, it, it sees it as part of its estate. It's a space. 
it's it's just part of a, part of the kind of buildings that kind of you know help university sort of do what it has to do, um, and and that those cat- categorizations, those ideas about what it, what a gallery was, just obviously didn't correlate at all with with the ways that we understood what a gallery space was, was for, um, and and didn't kind of correspond with the ideas that that we were interested in pursuing, i.e. The intellectual territories of, of curatorial and discursive practice. Um, the university, the well, Northumbria University where we work anyway, so understood its galleries as places just very much to show things in. It was the end point um, after the kind of process of thought or kind of making had taken place in. So it, it didn't understand them as a site for kind of practice, whether kind of curatorial or kind of artistic. Um, it wasn't a site for kind of thinking or making or talking. Um, and, and there seems to be kind of like a gap there in terms of understanding how, how it could actually sort of feed into teaching as well, which just seems like a bizarre kind of oversight given that it was actually located within the university. Um, you know, and then the organisational structure um, of how the gallery was funded and how exhibitions happened um, sort of seemed to actually sort of boil down to um, be primarily about sort of shipping things in and kind of shipping things out. <laughs> And, and the idea of the curator seemed to be, be based on that kind of like sort of ensuring that that mechanism was, and obviously it's very important getting things in the right place and getting rid of them, but um, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it, it, it seemed to be sort of somewhat at odds with the kind of, with, with the things that we wanted to kind of actually kind of realise and, and it was hard to get budgets available for anything other than, than shipping things in and shipping them out again. But that is a great definition of what a curator is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't it, yeah. Oh yeah, that's all I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we decided really that we had to be quite distinct from Gallery North as a group. We said Neuschloss were not Gallery North. And so we've carefully and deliberately constructed the ways in which we position ourselves um, in relation to the institution that we work within. So we are the gallery's curators. We're not a steering group or a board. Um, and we're also not a name for the gallery space. Um, and I mean, we're distinct for a number of reasons, but, but they're basically contingent on the negotiations of kind of, you know, between, between the intellectual and organisational structures of the institution. Um, our name is also, the name Neuschloss is also a response to, to these kind of structures. Um, we, we sort of wanted something that was deliberately kind of quite stupid um, and opaque, and, and well, at least within an institutional context, it kind of misbehaves. I mean, it's quite easy to kind of misbehave within, within a university. Um, we were quite interested to see how this name sort of appeared and started to circulate on internal documents and how it appears on kind of purchase orders and all of those kinds of paperwork that sort of seem to kind of um, comprise quite a, a kind of large part of university activity. Um, you know, so we, 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 um, <laughs> we sort of wanted it to be a kind of problem in itself as a kind of name. Um, just uh, just gonna, a few of the points about the wider context of, of, of Neuschloss and Gallery North at Northumbria University. Um, most of us um, who are sitting here, certainly on this panel today as well, were recruited by Northumbria University in the run-up to the Research Excellence Framework um, in 2014, 2014. It's amazing how quickly you forget the details. Was it 2012? 20, 20, 20, when was the last one, though? It was 2015. Last one, 2014. Well, the results came out. 2015, yeah. Um, so if those of you who don't know, the Research Excellence Framework is the assessment and evaluation of the research activity occurring um, within the university, and that actually has a massive impact on future funding. Um, so it's, it was also, in a way, it was kind of indicative of a particular kind of ambition that the university that we work at kind of had. Um, it, it wanted to try and kind of promote <coughs> itself as somewhere that actually had research activity kind of going on. Um, it's, it's an organisation that is the ex-Newcastle um, Poly, um, going back to the kind of uh, late, I think it was 1990 when it changed. Um, it's got 33,000 students, um, and it's also one of two universities um, within the fine, where there's a fine art undergraduate programme in Newcastle, um, the other being um, the Russell Group at uh, Newcastle University, which is just five minutes walk away. Uh, so, something else, I guess, which is important, which kind of sits sits behind this, as uh, in terms of a framework of us uh, as as Neuschloss, but also as academics and artists working within Northumbria University, uh, is a partnership uh, that was formed in 2010 uh, between uh, Northumbria University and Baltic. Um, it's a partnership that's since found its main manifestation uh, in a in a separate building, a building called Baltic 39. So it's a distinctive uh, building, physical building, physical architecture that sits separately from both uh, Baltic uh, and from Northumbria University, uh, but it's a shared facility. 
um, we merged out of an artist-run studios, a, a gallery um, called Waygood, um, and they were an artist uh, group, uh, very kind of grassroots, that operated in Newcastle uh, for a long period of time. Uh, currently, it provides a centre for Northumbria's postgraduate students, uh, and also it still retains uh, independent studios. Uh, most of the original artists that kind of founded or moved into that space through Waygood uh, have been priced out um, of that space, and that's partly the kind of the reorganisation of, of, of Baltic kind of branding across the building, and the sort of elevation of it architecturally, and it's also the sort of third part of that consortium, which is the Newcastle Council. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of us, in terms of postgraduate students, uh, it's top floor, um, it also houses a new gallery space for Baltic. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a large space, it's divided into two parts, but it's essentially one space, they're kind of equivalent um, gallery spaces there. And really that's a proposition of a, of a project space for Baltic. Um, exactly how that functions or doesn't <coughs> function, it's, it's, uh, it's run as a space through the curatorial, curatorial team at Bolton, uh, but exactly how that kind of functions or doesn't function in terms of an idea of a project space um, and what that kind of offers in terms of a, of a more of a different sort of um, practice, exhibition making practice is, is still sort of to be negotiated. It's still uh, largely seems very connected to a specific type of curatorial activity that, that Baltic kind of um, look at across their, their larger spaces. Um, <clears throat> and I guess the other thing there is that there is actually another space at Baltic itself, and there's a third level space which is, which is also named uh, in relation to Northumbria to, to I, I guess, as part of that partnership. Uh, so there's a Northumbria University Gallery space as part of the of the other Baltic site. Um, in addition, uh, Northumbria University uh, has also, until very recently, um, had a long-standing relationship with a space called the University Gallery. Uh, that's a large uh, space. Uh, it's got nice double-height uh, windows, um, and it sits adjacent uh, to Gallery North, but it kind of uh, faces the other direction. Uh, the programme there has been largely drawn uh, from artists, uh, many of whom deceased um, and I have to kind of add that's not ironic because most of the artists at Neuschloss are dealing with at the moment are uh, uh, recently deceased. Um, so, uh, but it represents, I guess, a sort of a, it sits there in the Northumbria Estates. Uh, the University Gallery uh, was run uh, very differently. It was run as a commercial uh, business. Um, and it advertised itself, it's kind of self-advertising on its website, um, mm -hmm. was the link between town and gown. I don't know what that means, really. Not sure what, <laughs> but what that means. Um, but it did, didn't, didn't have any relationship to teaching, uh, or really to contemporary art practice, um, as we would understand that to be. Um, this sort of recent development, so following it, there's recently been a review uh, of the University Gallery provision, which I guess kind of sits under, under this as well here today. Um, and the University Gallery um, as a, uh, uh, has ceased operation um, and it's been vacated by its uh, long-standing director. So it now actually just sits uh, as a vacant architectural space um, and is likely to become the new future physical space of Gallery North. Uh, to think about uh, Neuschloss, um, our first event, our, our kind of history, I guess, was in the summer of 2014. Uh, we hosted uh, the first DAS chat, uh, which we run as a, as a discursive print uh, workshop. So we worked physically on, on, some, uh, on producing some print matter as we, as we discussed, as we had a discussion. Um, and that was really to think about the university galleries. Um, and we had invited speakers to that, which included uh, Karen DeFranco, who's, who's here from Chelsea Space. Um, and those conversations have continued with Neuschloss, uh, contributing to events by Karen and also uh, Joyce Cronin, who's also here. Um, Joyce is from uh, After All um, and interconnected with um, Central St. Martins. Um, and the kind of the expansion of those conversations has been with uh, Warwick and Leeds. Um, and one of the things that's come out is this possibility of the University Gallery Network. Um, so I guess that's something something for here, this space. Um, and um, really looking at the um, 
potential of critique um, and a negotiation of that as a, as a, as a proposition. So today, I suppose there's three main things I've sort of identified. So what role do university galleries play within the institutions and also their localities? It seems an important thing which I think will come up both with, with Matthew and, and Gavin's presentations. Um, something we're particularly interested in, what possibilities, if any, can a university gallery offer for radical or speculative practices of exhibition, <coughs> making and teaching? Um, and how can the conf conflated and conflicted roles as academics and artists be negotiated? And that's something that we all feel quite strongly and quite personally a lot of the time. Um, so we just kind of move on, and I think we're just going to, I didn't get a chance to actually discuss the, the order of the talks, but if you're okay to talk first, Matthew, yeah. would that be okay? Yeah, delighted. Okay, um, well thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Um, some of my uh, students are exhibiting at this, so I'm very, uh, it's a sort of double whammy really. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, what I've, what I've sketched out is three kind of models, and none of them, when, when you were describing University Gallery, I realised the three models I've got don't really fit, but I think they're interesting. The first uh, example, if you like, of a university type gallery structure is is something that doesn't exist anymore. It was an exhibition called East International that was uh, an initiative by Linda Morris, who was then working at what was then called Norwich School of Art, which is now being rechristened Norwich University of the Arts. And the idea of East was to make use of, which, which has been mentioned already, to make use of the empty studios during the summer and to have uh, an open submission exhibition, annual open submission exhibition, and Linda would appoint two guest selectors, stroke curators, to choose out of what, at its peak, I understand, was up to a thousand applications. And from that, there would be a kind of selection down to 20, 25 artists, who would then be invited to come to Norwich. Now, what was interesting about that was that while some of the artists, you know, if you like, the work was trucked in and put on a wall, there was an opportunity for other types of work to take place and other kinds of activity to take place, not just in the studios, but also in the, she expanded it into, the, into, into Norwich itself and into the town. Now, you know, there's, there's a lot that could be said about East. Um, I mean, one of the things that could be, must be said about it was that there was a, it was a, you know, it was a springboard for a number of, you know, artists who've gone to very successful careers. You know, Martin Creed showed at East, Jeremy Della showed at East, Gavin Wade showed at East, Lucy McKenzie showed at East. Rune Islam, you know, there was a number of artists who took part in East. And it was a snapshot in time every year of what, you know, what people were doing. So what I was jotted down was what can we learn from East? Well, one of the things that's interesting is that it wasn't dependent on an expensive purpose-built gallery space. Um, this was a bit of a theme of mine. Um, <laughs> with all the associated costs of running such places. Uh, instead, of, instead, it made use of these empty studios during the summer months. Second thing I think we can learn was that because it was run, you know, relatively modestly, very modestly really, with, with, with Linda Morris and a very small team, it actually created quite a lot of opportunities for the students studying at Norwich to take part, to work as assistants, to be involved in the publicity, to be involved in the uh, even you know documenting work to be involved in the uh, organising talks. So it's a it's an interesting model of um, <coughs> internship on a local basis. But I think these were I think most people were paid. Another thing that was interesting about East that uh, but how how successful some of those people are as well. Yeah, indeed, yeah, yeah, Andy indeed. Hunt, Michelle yeah. Cotton, yeah. Andy Marsh, there's Kirsty yeah. Og. They all were assistants mm. on, yeah. on East. That's true. We rehearsed this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, the other thing about East that I think was interesting that it, it was very open to experimentation. Was, I mean, I was fortunate to try stuff out in East that never tried before, and, and there was backing for it. There was resource, and there was there was a sense, and that's what was required to do something new. Um, and I thought, I suppose, the final. Well, actually, I've got more than that. There's a couple of things. I mean, it, you know, it does provide this overview. On a, unlike the British Art Show, which is once every five years, this is this was every year. Uh, and curious people would apply. I mean, you know, lots of different people applied at different points in their career. You know, people who disappeared for a bit would come back. Another final thing, of course, is that it, you know, it did create, 
I think, you know, a bit of a boost to the economy in Norwich every summer. I mean, a lot of, I, I remember going, there's a lot of people went to East. I mean, it was quite a big, big party. So East, uh, which of course had its funding withdrawn in 2009. So another example of an untypical, but I think interesting model, which Gavin, I'm sure, will talk a lot more about, but I want to talk about it from a, <laughs> I want to talk about it from a, spectator's point of view, <laughs> is Eastside Projects. Now, as I say, I'm not overly familiar with it, exactly what that relationship between Eastside and the uh, Birmingham City University is, <coughs> but there is a relationship, and it's, it depends which website you go to, you get different descriptions of that. <laughs> and there's also, obviously, funding, well, you know, there's funding from Arts Council, there's funding from um, Paul Hamley. But what I was really interested in was that when, I, when I've been to East Side, is how it doesn't have the kind of, uh, it has a very stripped down rawness to it. And it feels very open to new thoughts and ideas. And I think one of the reasons for that is because it's very basically, it's in an old building. You know, it's, a, it's a cliche almost, that old, you know, new ideas need old buildings. And I think that's really demonstrated to me once when I went. And uh, there was these two guys, young, young artists, enthusiastically just smashing a hole through the, the, the building and the wall out into the street. Now, can you imagine that happening at Turner Contemporary? Can you imagine that happening anywhere? And it was just brilliant. And they were just kangaroo <coughs> to the walls of the building. It was, it was a very live feel. It felt very, very exciting. Is that the first you've heard about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're yeah. tunneling their way out. Um, <laughs> the, other, the, other thing, the other thing about uh, Eastside Projects is that it doesn't, it's, because of its, its, its separation in a way from the university, it doesn't suffer in the way that many university galleries do, in the sense that they, you know, one month it's the Czech glass exhibition, next month it's the undergraduate painting exhibition, next month it's the eminent printmaker from Hong Kong exhibition, you know, and you end up with this thing which you don't really, it's just bewildering, you, know, you don't really know what this gallery is about, other than it has these different things going on, and there's no sense of identity, and therefore you don't build up a rapport with an audience who are going to be, you know, go to it. I think Eastside does have a very strong identity. So what can we learn from that, or what could I learn from that? Um, again, building wasn't an expensive building, it's, is it a furniture? Factory or something? Uh, cabinet makers. Cabinet makers building, yeah. So it's not, there's no, it's not some, you know, landmark building. It's not like First Sight in Colchester or the Hepworth. It's not, doesn't have, won't be in the architectural press. Uh, relatively affordable, therefore, to maintain. Um, it, it has a relationship with the university of some kind, but it also maintains fiercely a kind of independence. And it has its own distinct programme, beliefs and philosophy. Uh, it also clearly is providing a lot of opportunities at various stages of people's careers in Birmingham and, and various ways in as well, as I understand it, in terms of, you know, not just artists but curators, people who want to be involved. That's very positive. Uh, the other thing about it is the, um, it's not, it doesn't look like, another, it doesn't have operate, it doesn't seem to operate quite with the same rules as other galleries. I mean, I'm very, I remember when Gavin started talking to me about it, I was very bothered. <laughs> I was very bothered by this idea that the past Previous shows, the trace of those remains, really bothered me, and, I, and I've, I'm, I'm always interested in things that bother me. And so, anyway, so as Gavin says, the gallery is many things, and I'm sure he'll talk more about that. I've got one more that I want to talk about very briefly, which is Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, or MIMA, in Middlesbrough, opened in 2007. One of a number of new multi-million pound galleries uh, to open in the UK in the late 1990s, early 20th century, including New Art Gallery Walsall, Turner Contemporary, Public, Hepworth, First Sight, Nottingham Contemporary. Um, and this, again, this is a huge and interesting and rich topic, uh, why this happened, why, why, why this all happened. But the, the, the basic premise for this was that um, there was a sense in which some of these, a lot, a number of these places could be regenerated economically and culturally through the building of a gallery, and the gallery would act as a sort of catalyst for the creative industries and for a, a whole new uh, economy coming to these various sites like West Bromwich or uh, Middlesbrough. 
And this is all, this originates to some extent from the success, the great success of the uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. And uh, recently I was funny enough looking at this this morning and there was a quote from The Economist. Other cities without historic cultural centres now look to Bilbao as a model of what vision and imagination can achieve. Well, that is true, but of course there are a number of problems with that concept when you apply it across the board anywhere. Uh, as we, we know, because the public in West Bromwich is actually closed, it's no longer a gallery, it doesn't, it was, the cost of that was so vast that it can no longer function. But anyway, back to Mima in Middlesbrough. So, I would say, having been there, that the, uh, it hasn't exactly caught fire, the Bilbao effect in Middlesbrough. It's interesting, but I wouldn't have said that there is a significant, huge um, tourist industry built around about that gallery in terms of visitor numbers. So what MIMA's done, again, it depends on which website you look at, but it's, it's transferred, apparently, into Teesside University. So you have this separate institution, uh, but it's now part of the university. And the university have actually, and, and, you know, and you know, the people running MIMA have actually negotiated this relationship where they are now connected. Now that obviously creates quite an interesting dynamic for them in terms of what that might mean for the, you know, for the gallery, but also in terms of, well, presumably they're both seeing it as a win-win in terms of the way that they'll increase visitor numbers, but also the prestige of the university. So what can we learn from that? I think one of the things would be to be very realistic about what a gallery can achieve within its location. I think a lot of, some of these galleries were built on the assumption that clearly have not been able to come to pass, you know, that, that they were going to completely transform somewhere in the way that, or allegedly the way the Bill Bowers worked. Um, I think you need to be very clear about what the criteria for success are and how those things have been judged. I think another interesting point, Mimo, is that if you are in the position of having a new gallery that costs a lot of money to build but also costs a lot of money to run, then clearly building relationships with other cultural or academic institutions could be a way of surviving, <coughs> in, given that the, it's very unlikely that there's going to be an increase in funding from the Arts Council and outside London getting you know, funding in the way that the Serpentine, Serpentine Gallery does is very, very difficult. I think the third thing, of course, is I think we, with hindsight, we, you know, it would have been good to have thought very carefully before maybe spending. 20, 30 million, 40 million or more on a gallery uh, out of public money. And I, and, I, and I think I go back to the two earlier examples. I mean, just imagine that that money had been more dis dissipated further across the country for projects such as East or Eastside projects, how dynamic that, that scene and situation would have been. Thank you. Thank you. Should we just move a bit on, Charlie, then do questions yeah, at the end? Yeah. So, G Gavin, do you want to yeah. speak next? Thanks. I'm just going to phone it in. Yeah. <laughs> phone a friend. <laughs> um, so, I am going to give you a list of many things. That's what, <laughs> what I thought I was going to start off doing. So, I'm going to uh, run you through a little bit of a, a draft asset register that I still need to update fully, but I think it's probably as good as uh, quite a good way to introduce the things that we do so um, and I start with the title of the first exhibition which is this is the gallery and the gallery is many things sculpture show abstract cabinet show curtain show book show narrative show painting show puppet show trade show Birmingham show display show production show policy show so that's, they're the titles of many of the, <coughs> the art function shows that we've done since 2008 that will run, also production show and policy show run until 2018, so into the future. We don't, we're still working out what they're going to be. Um, number one on my asset register list is, of, is Eastside Projects as a brand. I, I don't... Re, I don't often use that, that word and I don't really think of it like that. I think of it more as myth-making and that's part of our, 
um, part of our role and it's one of our assets, our ability to make myth and to build myth around ourselves and around Birmingham and for other artists and to, and to learn from other artists and people around the world who are also sending out messages that are parts of building myth. So I, I think our reputation, and I tried to, um, to create Eastside projects with lots of help from other people as if it already had a reputation when it opened. To, to sort of project that it's already the reputation's there and it's happening and so you don't need to worry about that, you just need to come along and be, be involved and part of it. And to do that it was to express an idea that Eastside Projects has many methods. We have methods of producing culture, of producing a gallery, of producing art, of working with others. And to prove that we've started to make users manuals. And the, so we've had six draft users manuals which each of them becomes um, a real uh, extra part, an extra individual asset that adds to the previous myth-making, the reputation. Um, the networks that we, as a, as a group, already had prior to the opening of Eastside Projects, and then to be able to, to utilise them and develop the networks. And through doing that, to the, the context of Birmingham, the context that we find ourselves in, and the way that we have developed that context. We try and alter the context of Birmingham and the way that people perceive Birmingham. Um, one of our assets is the, and this is part of the myth making of course, is the idea of our promise, that we might make a promise that a gallery is an artwork and that you might come to a different model of a gallery. So I think it's um, sometimes scary to make promises about what you hope you'll want your gallery and your art to be in the future but and all, all you can do is fail all you can do is you know not quite deliver that promise but you that to, to show that you are working to try and give that promise and achieve that promise so we have a model that's been proven over seven years now so we have a, a sort of proof of concept in a way a way to, to pitch an idea of what a gallery could be that you could create a new model that it may perform and have methods um, that, are, that are borrowed from many other types of galleries, from university galleries, from artist-run spaces, from museums, from other types of public galleries, from commercial galleries. All of those are incredibly useful, instructive and fascinating as contexts in which art flourishes. And there are lots of bits of each of one of those that are terrible and that we should get rid of and that we don't need anymore. So pick the good bits from them and combine them and, and make use of them. And that's, in a, that's part of what I hope that we, are, we attempt to do. We try and use the good bits and try and get more out of them. Um, very important asset is our relationship with artists. And that is also, also there's many, many types of relationships with artists and um, a very long-term relationships, very quick relationships, um, relationships that are borrowed from other people, relationships where it, you don't quite know it's going to lead to another stage, but people affect us. To make, to make a gallery is not to make a fixed thing that people get <coughs> shipped in and out of. That isn't what a gallery is. A gallery is part of the production of art, and it has to be affected by what people do in it. And that's, that's my belief. So I think any gallery that isn't affected by what artists do doesn't deserve the name to be called a gallery. It's merely a building. That's all it is. So, um, number two is, oh, uh, just to mention the idea of a relationship with artists, and that long term is the idea of perhaps managing and curating an artist. So, um, our relationship with Bill Drummond is that we are curating his world tour until 2025. And it goes to one country per year for 12 years. So we started the world tour last, last year, and there is that very, not that we are managing Bill Drummond completely, but we are managing an aspect of Bill Drummond's career. And, actually, and the way to do that is, was to learn how Bill manages. So Bill was a manager of bands in the 1980s, he's this famous manager, and to learn what it is, and, to, and for him to trust me and the gallery to be part of managing him and to be curating him and his practice over time is a real privilege in a way to be part of um, someone's life like that. So the second part, which I think also relates very strongly to that, and it is about relationships, is our extra special people 
membership, associate membership scheme, our ESP programme. It, it is a brand, again, and it has methods of connecting with people. The, the principal method is actually just to have come up with a mutual support system in a city that needed one, that needed more support for artists and other creative people, and that we as a gallery need people to support us. So, it, so we started to set up a scheme where you can, anybody can be a member and you can pay a small amount of money, you pay £60 a year, but if you've got 170 members like we do now, then that adds up to a chunk of money that we can programme with that benefits those people's careers. So it is an entirely mutual support system and, it, and allows us to raise other money to do more things. And that was one of the, that was, I think, a real success for us at the start to make Extra Special People, which was just out of asking people around the city, what do you think a gallery should do and what do you think Birmingham needs? And then just listening and trying to create something with those people that might be useful and to try and update that over time. You know, that's to keep questioning that and evaluating that. Um, and it creates lots of new networks. It's an ongoing, it's an idea machine, it's a network making machine. And it's a, it's a model for others to, um, to copy and learn from and improve, you know. So, and potentially there's ways to make money from just the idea of the model of that as well for other people, for us to charge for our knowledge about how to create a scheme like that around the world. So there's, there's other um, asset possibilities. Number three is the Eastside Project's directors. <coughs> so we, there's the asset of being, the, the idea of friends working together. So there are six, six directors, there myself as an artist curator, there's Ruth Claxton and Simon and Tom Bloor as artists. There's James Langdon as a graphic designer, and there's Celine Condorelli as an artist who's trained as an architect. So we bring different skills to the organisation, um, and then the, that idea of friendship and collaboration, um, that we can be mentors, we can be cultural producers, we can be cultural strategists, we can take the role of pr provocateurs, interrupters, master planners, commissioners, salesmen, uh, marketeers, critics, selectors, Judges, you know, our, part of our role is to make judgments and to not be afraid of that. I just, I want, and I've got this page open in the in the book, in the Neustadt book, which is you from the Chapman brothers of all people. It's a great quote: "You don't judge our art; our art judges you." And I, and that, that's really how I felt about Eastside Projects. I, I don't care about what you think right at this moment, Birmingham, because we are judging you. That is what our role is to come in and to change you by giving our judgments. If you want to see what we're doing, you, you know, you're very welcome. But that's, we are the, we're the artists of Birmingham and we are making the art for you, whether you like it or not, because that is our role in society. Live with it, learn to love it or hate it, but, but we're gonna be here doing it. So make, make, the, make, make the most of that. And I think over time, that, that little hard sell at the start comes down to, you know, actually use us, use us, make use of us in the city. And more people come to us all the time to, to use us. And I think that's, you know, you're, hap you want, you're happiest when you're being used. You want to be used. If you're, when you're not being used, you're really sad. You know, you just, please, come and use us more. Um, we are enforcers and protectors and storytellers with pancake makers, organisers and managers. So we find ourselves doing a lot of things. I mean, out of the six directors, then me and Ruth Claxton do more of the day-to-day -day running and organising and it's, and it's our often our drive and ambition that is there at the heart of it and then other of the directors come in at certain times and completely change <laughs> the feel of it and, and push us in a, another direction and make us think about something else, you know, so it's, it's a really, yeah, they're all the, the people I collaborate with most in the world and I wanted them all to come together. So um, the next down from that after learning, oh God, we have to become managers of a kind, is, is our staff and the, the structure of um, staff, um, gallery assistants, and other people coming through the organisation, which, that's why I mentioned that with East, actually, because it is that to, the gallery has to bring people through and put people out into the world that carry on some of the DNA of what they do and try and affect the world that way by going and running their own organisations, making other things happen. So really proud of being able to um, support other, other people to become curators, artists, or whatever else they want to become, and working with us at the gallery. So we have a one-year uh, assistant programme, 
um, which is you know it's paid living wage. It's it's a it's a starter job, but it, but you're but you have a lot of responsibility. You get to run the gallery basically. <laughs> so it's um, yeah, we we work them hard for their money. Um, our so our our alumni, which is not only staff, is the ESP members. Some people aren't ESP members anymore. They've gone off, but we still think they're in a type of alumni in the world. So we do have that sense of. Um, university thinking in the way that we think about spreading ideas into the world, I think. Um, and, that, and that was also about volunteers. So many, many volunteers come through the organisation as well, who sometimes end up becoming staff or end up in a show or something else. You know, there's a lot of opportunities there. And then that, that's our, our relationship with Birmingham City University affects all of those things. But a little bit of us the way we treat the university is that little bit of we judge you as well. We judge the university. We don't, we, I mean, I am actually senior research fellow at Birmingham City University now. There was a time where I wasn't running the gallery, but I was still treated as if I was and involved in a university strategy and meetings. Um, the university never only had a cultural strategy because of Eastside, <coughs> because of Eastside projects, and we had to reapply second time to Arts Council England for funding, we said, what is the cultural strategy of the university? What are, what are we going to tell Arts Council? You need to write a strategy. So we wrote a strategy with them of how, to, how the university should express itself. And that's really part of what, why we're useful to the university. We help it to think about how to engage publicly. When it is, you know, it's a massive public engagement machine, but often it doesn't, it doesn't engage in the ways that we think are important. So we then try and affect the university and try and work with them um, to consider things slightly differently. And, to, and that idea of policy and strategy is, re is ongoing. You know, there's lots of things that I want to feed into and I think that we can be useful to, to the university. And we're being asked in more and more senior positions within the university to try and do that. But I think still not enough. There's still things to change with the way that it flexes its muscles by making buildings around the city and its relationship with other um, very powerful organisations in the, in the city. That I think the art should be more an integral part of that process as an art and design university. So that they are, everything that they do should involve art. Everything they do. In the way that I'm interested in, if I'm going to spend money on a front door handle, then it, it can be an artwork. If we spend money, you know, there's some bits of the gallery we haven't done that. But we should do. We need to, you know, we, it's, it's part of that promise of trying to achieve that. Um, there's not many more. Hold on. Uh, so that comes down to yeah, individual things like the the door handle is an asset. Is actual. It actually has a value. We own that as an artwork. And we, if we move building, we can take the front door with us. I can take that door handle somewhere else, or we can, or we could place it somewhere else and um, and sell it to somebody in the future. It is an actual. It's one of the few physical assets that has a sort of art value and price to it. The other is Black Pleasure, which is our public space by Heather and Ivan Morrison, which has developed over seven years from Pleasure Island that started out as the first gallery office. And that's part of the long-term artworks of the gallery. So things like Martino Gamper's book displays that, that were developed in Bookshow, the front desk that has developed um, since this is the gallery and the gallery is many things up until trade show and involves myself and Celine and Catherine Boehm and Martino Gamper all collaborating on the construction of the front desk. Uh, we have curtains in the second gallery by Barbara Holub. We have a mobile wall system which has travelled from Vienna to Birmingham. I just took some of the mobile wall system to Dublin. I'm taking the mobile wall system out to Holland, to Strom. Uh, in January, so it is, it is very mobile, Mo more mobile than just in the gallery, it goes out around the world and I think that is a tool that carries the idea of narrative and the importance of context and storytelling and the idea that you should know all of the artworks that have ever been presented on that wall, it carries its history with it somehow. Um, there are relationships with other funders which are vital to us, the only way that we can survive by keeping those relationships strong and by developing new relationships. Um, there are things like our paid partnerships with organisations like Chiltern Railways and Birmingham <coughs> Big Art Projects where we're commissioning agents and curators. The stock in the gallery of publications and artist editions. There's things like the audience feedback form, which is at 
uh, outstandingly produced by Ruth. She made this, this, this glamorous audience feedback form that is um, coveted by many other institutions who want to steal it and, and convert that, even though recently she's been forced to put more stuff on it. So sometimes we're forced to do things. We've been forced to add in a few more questions because of the audience, whatever it's called, for, for Arts Council, which we've heavily criticised and said that you're asking the wrong questions. We want to ask different questions. So we do. We add in some different questions as well. And then finally, there is um, the deferred value of the commissioned artworks. And we try and get as much value out of the things that are in the space and that long-term life of the gallery. But also there are works that we commission that go out around the world. I mean, easy examples are things like film commissions. So we've recently we've commissioned films by Kerry Young and Chow Fei and Grace Schwint, and they continue to go around the world. And um, they're, they're sort of interesting things because sometimes they're, they're amazing films, amazing artworks, but they, because the process of making the film is away from the gallery, is often they are less satisfying as an organisation to work with. They're less, they have less impact on the building and on us as an organisation, even though the ideas filter in, but the process and the methods of being involved can be quite separate. But they have a very different way then of going into the world and myth making and continuing um, progress. So that it makes you ask questions about how are you going to work with artists and what does it mean when production processes change. So in production show, like, like we did with, with William Popel actually, trying to embed the filmmaking process if you're making a film into the life of the gallery itself. So it's not a distant um, element. So that's where I got to with the asset. Register, which you've heard a bit of before, actually, I just realised, yeah, <laughs> slightly updated. It's not quite <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so that'll do for now. So, we, I know we're kind of like never going to have enough time, and we started late as well. I'm sorry, it's my fault. Yeah, sorry. we should quit. Yeah, sorry, yeah. we should have done a round of applause for Kevin. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, I haven't got as elegantly organised talk as my previous two colleagues have. Um, but uh, to, to start by introducing myself, apart from the very, um, very lovely way in which you read out a bit of paper that you sent me, <laughs> that I, wrote. Um, uh, I, I was until very recently a professor at, uh, in the Art Fund at Goldsmiths, um, and I've recently moved to uh, Valand Academy in Gothenburg in Sweden, where I'm a, pro a professor now, a research professor. Um, and but what I want to do is talk uh, a little bit in quite a broad sense about what I call the economic ecology of university galleries and their position within the broader ecology of arts funding, both commercial and um, public, within the UK context and maybe London specifically. I think lots of things you and I, Gavin, already know are kind of crossover and are also differentiated by place. Um, but then I want to return specifically to a project that is occurring at Goldsmiths at the moment, which is the development of a new art gallery um, in one, on one of the university sites, which you may or may not know about, so I can talk to you a little bit about that, because I think it's, it, it's, a, very, it's, it's a site of politics. <coughs> say that, that I think we need to unpick. And, and, and maybe um, to be a bit more pedantic than my previous two colleagues who've spoken, I want to really focus on this question that, I, that you asked, us to, asked me to focus on, which is the specific relationship between an education institution, a gallery site, and its broader context. So, so I'm going to ask some very basic questions, which is, okay, why do higher education institutions need galleries? So number one, like mm. duh, it's like, <laughs> yeah. like, like you know? Now, of course, there's a historically formulated rationale for that, which I think, Matthew, you alluded to, and I know your research into your kind of photographic and research project into you know, sites of university, spaces of, of, of showing and experimentation um, alludes to, which is there's historically, of course, within the art school context, always been an, uh, um, a requirement, a necessity, often driven by artists, for there to be space of exchange where experimentation can take place and people can try out ideas of exhibiting, of displaying, of displacing their work from the studio into a different context. That's been a very vital, um, though um, <coughs> also criticisable model of what arts education should be. So, first of all, to say that the relationship between concept of display and the concept of art education 
is very deeply ingrained into how we think of how artists and nowadays curators should, need, and must be trained. So we could begin, and I'm not going to do it now because it's a different conversation, but we could begin to think about whether that relationship, how that relationship is formulated, and how it is formulated economically. And I don't just mean economically in terms of um, setting artists up to um, sell their wares as assets with deferred value, as Gavin has described, but also how it works as part of the social economy of how we understand the artist's role within a socio and political context, generally speaking. So I think that, first of all, I would say that's my initial question, which is why do our, uh, galleries, I mean, uh, uh, why do higher education institutions need spaces of display? Okay, what is that about? And do we think about uh, enough about how we have naturalized that? So much so that we think um, uh, you know, that, that it's obvious that artists need places of display. Now, I know this sounds completely counterintuitive because you think, well, artists, stuff out there, <laughs> in there, da la la. But I, I think given the models of experimentation, both in education and in artists' work, many of which I've seen at Eastside Projects, given that Eastside Projects started with a, 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 an organisation called Support Structure that wasn't actually in a space, okay, yeah. and moved in as part of an experimentation into a space, I think there's many, many interesting things to think about that would denaturalise that relationship between displaying and um, educating. Okay? There are many, many forms of experimentation that happen not simply, and maybe I will challenge you here, Matthew, or maybe what I, I, I picked up from you, not simply um, within the extra spaces that are not commercial or not kind of nationally or not memed in a sense, but, um, um, but, but, but those are sites where experimentation happens all the time. I've just come from the Death Star. I've just come from a, a week <laughs> at Freeze, okay? Um, where I work with, you know, commercial galleries, not-for-profit galleries, internationally all the time for my, you know, kind of sins. And um, I would say the most experimental spaces at the moment are many, many small-scale commercial dealers, okay? <laughs> and the relationship they have with artists very similar to the relationship that you describe as, as, as with, with artists as well, okay? Let me carry on, you can come back to me on that one. Sorry, I should have, should have not um, provoked you. <laughs> okay, so that's the first thing. So what is this relationship then? Okay, so we say there is a history, as you know, there is a history of this relationship where higher education institutions, coming from the poly um, um, model, as you quite rightly um, pointed to historically, have made this relationship where there is a space, where there is a kind of viable relationship between a spatial formation, which of course also subscribes to the idea of artists making a final degree show and being assessed on it, and all these kind of things that we could really question in terms of how artist education is delivered, not only in this country, but also within an Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-European context, particularly by looking at different models of um, artist and artisanal craftsmanship, um, or personship, should I say. So we, there, there's a series of assumptions that are already in place. But let's say that we, we accept that there is a history, and we know there is a history, of, um, of galleries developing from or being instituted by higher education <coughs> institutions. So then the question emerges, how are they sustainable economically? How do they sustain? Okay. How many higher education institution galleries do you know of that exist purely on the funds that are produced nowadays by student finance, by student um, uh, um, fees, but previously have been um, funded through the university purse? Now, I think, and Matthew, you might be able to tell us this through your research, I would imagine, and I, this is not um, a qualitative research that I'm suggesting <laughs> today, but I would imagine that whereas initially that would have been the case, they would have been produced um, by uh, the benevolence of the university kind of patronage um, and, and being seen as a good spaces, maybe because students demanded them, maybe because staff were interested in them, etc., etc. Nowadays, they are unsustainable without public or private funding, which means that they are directly in competition with the small scale for profit and not for profit art spaces that are part of the cultural economy of the cities and nations and international contexts in which they sit. Okay? So we're now faced with a situation where many 
higher education institution galleries, and I think we could, I'm looking at Karen, we could think about Chelsea Space in relationship to this, we could think about the John Hansard Gallery in relationship to this, we could think about, um, we could think about Eastside Projects in relationship to this, but we could also think about the new Goldsmiths Gallery in relationship to this, which is that what university galleries are now doing, because of um, de desire and demand to survive, they are placing themselves directly in correlation and competition with the, uh, the sites that have historically supported the work of their alumni that is both commercial and not-for-profit spaces. Now, of course, let's not make moral judgments. Why shouldn't they, okay, if they're good? They've got a Gavin and a Celine and a Simon and Tom, etc., and, and a Ruth, I saw her earlier on, at Freeze Masters, actually. Um, uh, they've got good people at the top, interesting people, people that are also artists themselves. Why shouldn't they put themselves in relationship to those, those funding schemes? But I think we do need to recognize that as a fact. I'm not going to say much more because, um, because I know we're running out of time and partly because I was late, so I, <laughs> it's, it's not, not, not fair for me to hog the space. But I just want to come back to the Goldsmiths um, model. So Goldsmiths have recently, um, uh, well, actually for about a period of five years, have been raising money or attempting to convince the Goldsmiths Art Department, I should say, convince the broader um, uh, staff and structure, infrastructure, senior management team at Goldsmiths to support, get behind uh, the building of a new gallery in uh, New Cross in London. <coughs> For those of you who don't know, is where Goldsmiths, um, which is part of the University of London, is sited. And, um, and, um, and uh, it's, it's, it has been taken up by a very cultural industries friendly senior management team who can see very clearly, along with some um, quite important players at Deloitte and other property management industries that are quite interested in, um, in the gentrification of New Cross. <laughs> Anybody that's been to New Cross will tell you, know, you can tell that it's actually, it's, it's the one place that still hasn't properly been gentrified in the whole of London. Possibly not, but you know, might be good reasons for that. It's very good for students because it means they can still afford to live there. Um, uh, but of course, the horizon means that that's going to that's going to be eradicated pretty quickly. Um, so the senior management team of Goldsmiths have been um, have have got behind the idea of a of a of a gallery, not because I would say, um, and obviously, if um, the head of the art department were here speaking, he would have a different narrative. But I would say not because the senior management team of the university are interested in <coughs> expanding the possibilities of experimentation in display of graduates from the art department and many other places at Goldsmiths, because art is made in many other places, often far more interestingly than from the art department itself. <laughs> and I speak as a, somebody who's taught in the art department for 12 years, so it's part mea culpa. Um, but um, they're interested in it because of its because it means they'll get invites to certain places. <laughs> because they've, they've, uh, they've, they've commissioned a Turner Prize nominated architectural firm to design, and they've commissioned a Semble Turner Prize nominated firm to make it, an um, office, sorry, architectural office, and because they can see it being a way that they can draw down different forms of financial um, uh, asset to the normative ways in which education is funded. Now, my argument with Goldsmiths um, ha has been, for the last five years, that A, um, well, it's twofold. Firstly, if this site could be, A, and I agree with you, Matthew, that uh, this is not a necessarily a site that needs um, a head lining architectural firm to convert it, and it could, you know, if, if there needs to be more space to show stuff, then, you know, let's just, show stuff in the spaces that are already there. I don't necessarily need to be there, although of course I've already stated my reservations about this relationship between education and display in the first place. But secondly, um, what this um, potentially does is it completely undermines the historical embeddedness of the art industrial complex that is at work in Goldsmiths itself, which, you know, for, for those of you that don't know, is probably the most kind of um, economically charged art school in the whole of the UK. It's variously good and bad at sustaining that, but it's definitely, that is definitely its side, okay? 
So, and that's certainly the way it is seen, and it's certainly seen as being the place where Turner Prize winners come from. Not that that necessarily means that you go on to earn a huge amount of money as an artist, as we know, but it's seen as the place where commercial dealers come into the graduate show and pick off the creme de la creme, etc., etc. So it's always had, since the mid-1990s, this relationship, and it's a relationship that, um, that despite its political pronouncements and problematics, has an ecology to it. Now, I'm also the trustee of Chisholm <coughs> Gallery, which is a, 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 a very long, it's a 25-year-old um, gallery that's been, actually not 25, 30-year-old gallery that's been, um, that's been um, in the East End of London since before the East End of London was and then stopped being the place to go to see art. And, um, the, uh, and, and Chisholm Hale is extremely pissed off with Goldsmiths for opening a gallery. Because Chisholm Hale understands that Outset, for instance, which is a group of um, rich patrons that club together and fund things, including Freeze Projects, so obviously Freeze, one has to be very clear that Freeze gets public money as well as just commercial money. So nothing's clear mm. in this ecology, this economic ecology. Um, Freeze, uh, so, so um, Outset, who is just one example of a consortium of private funders that are interested in um, what could we say, public good projects within their cities, and we're talking about London specifically here, um, are diverting their attention from Chisholm Hale, I work closely with the showroom, I work closely <coughs> with South London Gallery, the galleries I work closely with, they're diverting their attention away from that, and they're going, oh, it's a new box of chocolates over here, let's fund <laughs> this one, okay? Now, um, again, you know, we live in a, a kind of Hayekian um, economy uh, where, um, you know, the chocolate box is open to anybody to invest in, one could say. And, you know, the people that survive, survive. And obviously, Eastside Projects is one of the survivors for all its assets, so because it's <laughs> asset reach. Although I know how hard it, it, it yeah. is to kind of maintain that survival. However, I think that we need to, to kind of summarise, I guess, because I know I'm saying a lot. Uh, I think that the level, there are three levels, say, that we need to think about this relation between education, higher education, the training of artists. The first one is at the level of display. So why are we continuing to promote this unsustainable relationship between success and display? Secondly, we need to correlate that with the ambitions of the art market, both in London and internationally, and in Birmingham too, where there is, I hear, a developing art market. Quite small developing art market, but <laughs> and thirdly, we need to think about that in relationship to the politics of the economisation of culture more generally and understand how university galleries are, on the one hand, forced to, and on the other hand, are ambitious to participate within that. Mm -hmm. yeah? That's great. Thank you. Cool. Well I'm afraid that we, we're... That's it. Uh, we have absolutely no time for we any no questions time whatsoever. Time we're just going to... We're just going to... I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor